There are a lot of ways to get renewable energy. Geothermal energy is technically getting energy from the heat from the earth. But there's another type that's actually much more widely applicable, and that's called geothermal loops. You're really not getting the stored energy from the earth's core. You're getting stored thermal energy from the fact that the sun for hundreds of millions of years or longer has been beating down on the earth and it's warmed up the top surface layer. At a certain depth, the temperature is very constant, sort of like the average constant temperature of the earth. In this part of the country, that temperature is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 degrees Celsius. So if you had a way to capture that temperature, you could always have your home at 10 degrees Celsius. Which is not terribly comfortable, but it is a very good way to start out. For instance, in the summer, air conditioning down to 10, or at least having something that's that temperature, 50 Fahrenheit, would be awesome. It becomes a virtually free air conditioning system. And in the winter, if you wanted to heat your home up from a certain level, at least up to the 50 degree level, you get that for free as well. There's a device called a heat pump, and it works just like an air conditioner works. Think about an air conditioner. If you ever take a window unit and you put your hand out the window or you stand behind it, you say, my gosh, hot air is coming out. It's putting cold air out one side, hot air out the other. You realize you could just turn that air conditioner around in your window and be heating the inside of the house and cooling the outside. That's a heat pump. As long as I have a difference in temperature of energy source, I can take that 50 degree Fahrenheit water and I can use that as my heat source to be able to actually extract heat and go up to a higher, more comfortable temperature compared to the outside air. I've told you what they are, but it's really neat to be able to visualize them. This would be a typical geothermal loop type of system. You take some yard space and you make a bunch of coils and loops of uh, pipe that go underground. You're trying to take that stored thermal energy that's under the ground and make sure the water in those pipes comes out at uh, perhaps a warm or a cold temperature, depending if you're doing heating or cooling, and comes back into the house at 50. You don't want to cool off the ground, so you could have a variety of systems. This type of system where you go vertical actually requires less land. Because if you use one of the horizontal systems, you can see that if you need to bury all of this, basically you need to dig up your whole yard, put this down, get it well below the frost line, and then bury the whole yard in again, which is quite a mess. It's probably easier to do a system like this, where you drill vertically down a series of wells, and you can go really deep. I've been teaching about this for quite some time. And in looking at the economics, it appeared that if I ever built a new house, we should use geothermal loops. Fortunately, we had a lot of land. And when we went to build a new house, we said, yes, we're going to put in a geothermal system. This brings us to the economics of a geothermal system. It's going to cost more. One, you have to actually do the type of drilling installation to get these pipes underground. And two, you need to buy a heat pump system instead of a conventional furnace. When I looked at the economics, it looked as though we could get a payback in about five years. House is eight years old now, and I think we're just reaching payback because there were, of course, some unexpected expenses. Still, though, it has been a tremendous bonus to us in the summer. In the past, a graph of energy use versus time would always show a spike in your electric bills over the summer because of air conditioning. These days, we have no spike in our bills during the summer at all because we can air condition by simply using the water from under the ground. 
Here's a picture of the land near our house. We had to have a part that was not part of the farmer's field and not part of a forest. And we had such a grass strip, so the drilling rigs came in. This particular drilling rig, pictured here, has a, a four inch bore. You can see the drill head and all of the drill casings. Each of these holes went down 216 feet, and there were six of them. The series of pipes were in a long trench, and that long trench had each of these six spots separated by a couple hundred feet. It was important that all of the connections are well under the frost line, because if this ever freezes, well, I don't know, it could rupture the pipe, and there goes your whole investment. After each of the holes were put in and the pipe run going down and up in loops, we pressure tested each of them to make sure that the pipes were, were solid and would never break. And ideally it's a 25, 50, 25 to 50 year installation before it would have to be replaced. Another important aspect is to make sure that you don't contaminate your water supply. Just like with an oil or gas drill, if you drill through the water table, which by us is about 75 feet where our well is, you have to make sure the groundwater cannot penetrate down to where your water supply, your water table water is. And you do that anytime you drill down by using a nice thick consistency clay type of mud that makes an impermeable barrier. So in each of these places where the drill casings went through the ground, we made sure there was this type of, of mud-type impermeable clay layer stopping runoff from being able to somehow penetrate down into the water table layer. The end result is over each of the penetrations, you end up with a uh, muddy mess. And if you look at the whole length, we now have six different places where pipes go underground, deep into the ground, and have a impermeable water barrier layer around such pipes. So this is great. I now have a bunch of guaranteed 50 degree water out in the field and you have to get it to the house. So you've got to dig a nice deep trench all the way through the woods to the house below the water line and eventually you get the one going into the house. This goes to your heat pump. So where we live, the winters can get pretty cold. And that is one disadvantage of geothermal loops. Because below around 20 degrees Fahrenheit, below around minus 5 Celsius, heat pumps are not terribly efficient. And while we can certainly heat our house up to 50, 10 centigrade, to get warmer than that, when the temperature outside is that cold, it becomes very difficult. Our geothermal loop system actually has what's called an emergency backup, where it takes electric resistance heaters, just like a toaster would, and it, you can blow your hot air over it. Those bills become very expensive. And when we looked at the payback, indeed it would have only been a five-year payback in the system, but if you have an extremely cold winter and you're dealing with just resistive heating for those periods, your electric bill skyrockets, which of course then throws off the whole calculation of how long it would take to pay back the capital cost for that system. The best system would be not to rely just on electricity for backup, but to also have some natural gas furnace or liquid propane furnace or something that in the coldest days you could use a more conventional heating system. But then your capital cost is probably even larger. So the pros and cons of geothermal loops. Pros, you get a pretty standard energy free source of heat. You can get very inexpensive air conditioning. The cons, there is an additional capital expense you have to look at your economics carefully. And if it gets too cold, the system becomes much less economical than it would if you had a conventional heating system. 
That's what you need to know about geothermal loops.